dedicated to uh, preserving the history of the health sciences in Arkansas. There are other archives that collect materials on the health sciences, but we're the only one that that is our specific mission and specific uh, priority. We were established in 1978. We're home to all sorts of artifacts, rare books, photographs, archival collections. So when we're able to open back up again to the general public, I hope you'll come and visit, uh, visit us sometime. Um, and if you have any materials that uh, deal with uh, any aspect of the health uh, sciences in Arkansas, we'd love to talk with you maybe about donating those to the collection, especially materials that are dealing with uh, the pandemic uh, at this time. Uh, flyers, photographs, diaries, journals, things like that. We're really interested in, in collecting materials documenting the pandemic. As I mentioned, tonight's uh, these stay-at-home lectures are sponsored by the Society for the History of Medicine and the Health Professions, which is the support uh, friends group of the Historical Research Center. If you're not a member of the Society, I hope you will consider joining. Membership dues are inexpensive, $5 for students and $15 for an individual. And then we have family and uh, uh, differing, uh, different levels of uh, membership. There's the uh, website on, the, on your screen that you can go to, to to sign up, or if you'd like to uh, not type up that long URL, you can just go to paypal.me uh, um, slash um, shmhp and uh, you can just join from there. A couple of notes for tonight. Everyone's audio is on mute and so is your video, so no one can hear you or see you. Uh, and you will be able to ask questions at the end of the session using the chat feature in this, uh, up in the, in the, in the, in the Zoom presentation. Um, before we jump into the presentation, I'd like to, uh, highlight a couple of the society's board members. We've been doing this for the last couple of uh, lectures now. Mary Ryan is a, is a former associate provost for library and student services at UAMS and she serves as the organization's past president. She's long been a supporter of the society and the historical research center and works tirelessly to promote both entities. And Mary is also the co-author along with Bill Russell and William Lindsay of the new book, A Family Practice, The Russell Doctors and the Evolving Practice of Medicine, 1799 to 1989, which has just been published by the University of Arkansas Press. The letters used in that book uh, are used at the as the foundation for that book are housed at the Historical Research Center. And uh, we're, we're pleased to have that collection. The book is available for purchase right now at, at the University of Arkansas Press website. And I hope uh, you will each consider buying a copy of that. Mary and her uh, co-authors are going to be giving a presentation uh, on the book on August 20th. And um, so I hope you'll join us for that. Uh, the other board member that I'd like to highlight tonight is Edgar Meyer. He is a native of Mississippi and he's currently an assistant professor in the Department of Neurobiology and Developmental Sciences in the College of Medicine at UAMS. He's also one of our newest board members. He was just uh, uh, elected back in March, and so uh, we're glad to have him on the board, and thanks to uh, Edgar and Mary for everything that they do uh, for the uh, society. And here's the, we have four more of these lectures left. Um, Next lecture, August 6th, is going to be Tom Dillard, pioneering African-American doctors in Arkansas. As I mentioned, Mary and her co-authors are August 20th, and then we have uh, September 3rd and September 17th. So if you wanna go ahead and mark those down on the calendar, uh, we'd love to see you. The link that you use tonight is going to be good for all of those upcoming lectures. And tonight, we're pleased to welcome Dr. Eric Macias, he serves as Associate um, Dean for Faculty Affairs in the College of Medicine at UAMS, where he is also a professor of psychiatry. He received his medical degree in his native Brazil and a PhD and a Master's of Public History from Johns Hopkins University. I'm glad to have him as a colleague at UAMS and I'm pleased to welcome him tonight. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Eric.
Oh, I'm muted. Yeah, there you are. You should be okay now. All right, thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you for, for the invitation, Tim. I appreciate uh, this society and the in in interest in history that we share. Um, I am happy to see a couple of uh, UMS uh, team members uh, as part of this conversation. And uh, thank you for being here tonight, uh, all of you. Uh, to me, it's an honor to, uh, to, to be able to tell this story. Uh, let me see, share screen. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. To me, do, 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 to me <clears throat> it's a great honor to be able to tell this story. It's a great story, and I hope that uh, I'll be able to, um, to do it, it justice. Um, I have, um, I'm humbled by it. I learn every time I give this lecture. And, uh, and it, it's really, um, as I said, it's an honor to me. I'm, I'm, I am, uh, I'm given the honor to tell this story and, uh, and, I, and I'm deeply appreciative of that. Uh, uh, that came about uh, two years ago, in 40, in, uh, um, 2018, when we, uh, when we celebrated uh, 70 years of, of this, um, of, of, of this uh, uh, historical event in our College of Medicine. It's been, um, we, have, we have commemorated, and I, I'm ha I have to say, when we, when we uh, celebrated uh, the 70 years of her enrollment in our college, uh, she came to Arkansas and she spent a few days with us uh, um, and it was, uh, it was a great honor to see, to actually meet her. Uh, 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 she has since uh, passed away and so we lost her, we lost her uh, physical presence, but which to me makes this story even more compelling and more important. Uh, uh, these are stories that are actually very recent. So I give the example of us meeting with her two years ago because to, to remind us of how recent this history is and, uh, and how much we have to uh, uh, understand our history, respect, uh, and, uh, and learn from it. So I, I, I'm, I'm trying not, uh, it's been a very exhausting day, so I'm trying not to be, uh, uh, I, I want to engage with you. So I hope not to be, make this boring. So, so let me tell you how, how I'm gonna organize this conversation first. I'm going to start by acknowledging some people that helped me uh, uh, um, to put this together. I, this is not something I did by, all by myself. Um, first and foremost, uh, the, the UMS Center for Diversity Affairs, which now is actually our division of uh, um, diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we have a vice chancellor uh, uh, at, at the helm, and, uh, and they do great work. I also want to, to uh, thank uh, Tim Nutt, our uh, um, director of the Historical Research Center for the UMS uh, 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 Library and for the UMS campus. Um, he does an amazing job collecting a lot of our history and, uh, and making it available in, in exhibits and in, in, in lectures like this. Thank you, Tim. I uh, appreciate your work. Uh, the faculty center where I work, uh, um, Dr. Vanessa Gamble is a physician uh, who, wrote the, who wrote a paper that is actually the basis of this lecture. Uh, it's a paper that she wrote uh, in academic medicine um, or is in, in, the, in, in one of the his, uh, history of medicine journals. Uh, um, and I use a lot of her, the information that she collected, she put together. Tom South, our director for admission, gave me one piece of paper that I'm gonna show it to you today, a historical piece of paper, a copy. And David Ware, Dr. Ware, who is the Arkansas capital historian, who is now actually uh, the state historian. I think. Tim may know what his, 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 his correct title is, but, uh, but David uh, helped me understand some of the background history on Arkansas to make this lecture more interesting to you. So I hope this will be, this will be a, a place to learn. I'm gonna, I'm gonna organize this lecture in four simple questions, actually. Why, why Edith Irby Jones? Why 1948? Why Arkansas and why does it matter? Why, 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 why do we, why, why is this story still important? And why is this history still unfolding 
in front of our eyes. So, so that's what I want to do. Why Edith Irby Jones? What, what is it about this person that, uh, that makes this uh, important? <clears throat> Here's why. This is a photo of her when she graduated medical school. Uh, that's the photo we still have at our, uh, um, our medical school entrance um, among all the other students that graduated that year, 1952. But let's go back uh, before that. Uh, way before that, uh, uh, um, she was a young woman, and way before that, she was born <laughs> in December 23rd, uh, uh, 1927. She was born in Conway, Arkansas. Uh, she was the daughter of a sharecropper. She was the third daughter of a sharecropper uh, 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 and a house, uh, housewife uh, um, who also did uh, um, uh, 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 work for, for others. Uh, uh, and um, at the age, and, and that's, uh, there are some conflicting reports, but at a very young age, between the age of three and seven, her father died. Uh, so her mother became then a single mother with five children. After Edith, they had two other children. Out of those five, two died in infancy. Um, her father died, and, uh, and I just learned more, more recently uh, something that to give you a sense of, of, of life in, 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 in doing this is Arkansas in the late 1920s. Uh, she was born in 27. So um, her, her father, prized possession, was a Ford T model. And, uh, and, uh, and they had this car that, that they were very proud of. And they had borrowed money to, to do the harvest that year. When her father died, uh, 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 the owner of the farm. Uh, said that he, he owned the, the money and the, her, mother, her mother would have to pay. She did not have any money, but she had the car. So, not, so she lost her father and her mother lost the main uh, family uh, possession at that, the same time. And they became, uh, they, they end up in a very difficult financial situation, going to live with, uh, with um, family members in the Conway area. Eventually, the family decided that uh, uh, her grandfather, the, 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 the mother, of her, the father of her mother, uh, lived in Hot Springs, and they thought that in Hot Springs they would have more educational opportunities. So, so her mother took her family to uh, Hot Springs, and 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 there in there uh, something uh, already uh, interesting was starting to happen. Edith was. Um, was past several classes because she was she was very smart. She was a dedicated student, uh, uh, so she was past a couple of classes. That's why she's going to graduate so young. And you're going to see how she's how young she she graduates and she gets to medical school. But um, she, remember, she was born in 27, and, and she was she was admitted to medical school in 48. So um, she she sees she loses. So I told the two of the children died in infancy. She remembers uh, losing her uh, sister to a typhoid fever. In Arkansas in the 1920s and 30s, there are several epidemics of ty typhoid fever, and one of them took the life of her sister, Juanita. Uh, she credits that loss to her interest. She credits that loss, uh, her interest in, in medical education and becoming a physician. She felt that her sister could have survived if she had had medical attention. And because they were poor, uh, um, they could not afford uh, um, medical care. So that's Edie Derby Jones. <clears throat> she graduates high school in Hot Springs, very, very good student. <clears throat> and she goes to Knoxville College in Tennessee. <clears throat> While she is in Knoxville College, she maintains a straight A uh, 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 point uh, average. She um, is part of the um, Delta Sigma Theta sorority. She's part of the debating team and she's part of the drama club. And she also working to support herself as a typist and office assistant. So she supports herself through undergrad uh, uh, college education. <clears throat> and she graduates cum laude getting a bachelor in science with two majors. 
two majors, one in chemistry, actually one major in chemistry and two minors, one in biology and one in physics. She knew that to go to medical school, she needs, you need to take the MCAT, which is the medical, uh, 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 the medical college aptitude test. She takes it uh, 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 in early 1948. Okay, so now we get to the next question. Why 1948? What happens when Edith Derby Jones takes the MCATs in 1948? Why 1948? Well, <clears throat> as you may remember, the first half of the 20th century, uh, um, the vast majority of medical schools in the United States were closed to African Americans. The vast majority of African American physicians were uh, 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 graduated from two medical schools, uh, historically uh, black medical schools, Howard in DC and Meharry in Tennessee. Um, no, no other school in the South besides Meharry took any African American students. Uh, and very few schools in the North took African American students, and even those were admitted under restrictive quotas. At that time, the opportunities for education were based on the decision of the Supreme Court in the late 1800s called Plessy versus Ferguson, which basically created the framework of separated but equal. So the, the states could maintain a segregated school system, segregate, segregated educational system, uh, um, as long as it was uh, 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 separated but equal. We know that's not, that's not possible. And actually one of the, uh, uh, um, one of the um, historians that looked into this uh, said that it was actually separated and non-existent in terms of graduate schools for African Americans. So the NAACP in the person of their uh, 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 legal uh, chief called Charles Hamilton Houston uh, uh, created a strategy. They divided a strategy which was, we're gonna get uh, talented African-American students to take the admission tests, have them apply, have them denied based on separated but equal, go to court and say that this is not equal, you have to admit this person. They got their break in 1935. So again, some of the, mess, some of the messages along the way, right? This is, not, so 1935, and we, we, we're gonna get to 1948, but 1935, a young man called Lloyd Gaines takes uh, uh, the admission test for the law school in Missouri, a state law school, the Missouri uh, uh, law school, University of Missouri Law School. So he takes the test and he, and he passes and he, he has the grade to be admitted to the class. The state of Missouri uh, 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 offers to pay him a scholarship for him to go, take, go to law school out of state. He says, no, I'm going to, I want to go to school here. I was admitted here. I live here. Uh, 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 so he sued. They sued into county and state court in Missouri and they lost, which was actually part of the strategy because they wanted to take this to the Supreme Court. They take this to the Supreme Court and three years later, 1938, the Supreme Court of the United States decides six to two um, that out of state uh, scholarship programs uh, in, in the absence of a law school uh, denied African Americans equal protection. Now that's that that's an interesting structure, right? It's an interesting decision. The Supreme Court is basically saying that if an African American in your state qualifies to this school to be admitted, uh, uh, the way you select your students, if there is no African equivalent school for African Americans, he has to be admitted in the state-supported school. Now, <clears throat> the sad and tragic uh, 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 ending of this particular story of Mr. Gaines, Lloyd Gaines, is that he never, he was never admitted uh, to the University of Missouri uh, Law School. 
because in the meantime, between 35 and 38, he had moved to Chicago looking for employment opportunities and he disappeared. He disappeared. He was never found and nobody knows to this day what happened to him. Uh, um, it's one of these stories that I think helps, uh, helps us understand some of the feelings and some of the thinking that, that, that exists, some of the suspicions that exist in the African-American communities about our society. This person disappeared. He was never, he gained, he, gained, he goes all the way to the Supreme Court, he gets a favorable decision, uh, he's gone. But that decision uh, was heard throughout the South. The, the, the United States, uh, 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 especially the Southern states, they knew that if there was no African-American schools, graduate schools, law, especially law and medicine, they would have to admit an African-American student. <laughs> a very sad uh, 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 coda to this story is that a young woman by the name of Ada Sipwell um, gained pass uh, the, 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 the entrance exam for the Oklahoma, the University of Oklahoma Law School. And uh, so that, that, that I, I tell you the side story so, so people understand how hateful we were just a few generations ago. And still, some of us still carry that legacy. All of us have that in the background. Uh, uh, um, in Missouri, uh, in 40, 47 was a year before Edith. Sipwell passed the law school in the state of Oklahoma. This is Oklahoma. The state of Oklahoma creates a law school just for her. It was to be an African American law school that they call Lincoln School of Law. They had one faculty member and one student. Um, of course, Ms. Sipwell did not accept that. She sued. And she eventually gained admission to the School of Law in Oklahoma in 1949. Now, that's 49. So what happens in 48? In 48, I told you, you already, I already told you, Edith Abbey Jones took the MCAT and got very good, very good grades. So she applies to medical school. Think about this. When we celebrated this, it was in 2018, and we were celebrating 70 years of this fact. Our School of Medicine in Arkansas, now I'm going back to the UMS College of Medicine timeline, was created in 1879. So it took this school 69 years to admit the first African-American student. So only very recently, we crossed the threshold where, when the majority of our history was an integrated history. For the first 69 years of existence, um, the University of Arkansas College of Medicine, our College of Medicine, where we work, was an all white institution, a institution that, that was uh, um, closed to African-American faculty members or African-American students. I, so when I say this, I always remind people that it, I'm not saying that the college was, uh, 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 there was no African-Americans in the college. I'm sure there were African-Americans in the college. There were African-Americans that built the first buildings. Uh, there were African-Americans who served the patients, served as patients. There were African-Americans serving uh, as our staff. So African Americans have been present because African Americans are part of the history of the state of Arkansas. <clears throat> it just happened that we did not accept them as students or faculty members for 69 years. <clears throat> that's why this, this is uh, that's one of the reasons this story is so important to me, is to realize where we are. Helps us understand um, this, the idea of systemic racism that we live until very recently and very explicitly, and we still have the remnants of that in our minds, in our institutions, in our institutional memories, in our societal memories. So <clears throat> Arkansas, though, 
did not have uh, uh, money to create another medical school. Arkansas was just sitting here and deciding uh, at that time, the, ma the main uh, African American school for professional school for African Americans was in Pine Bluff. Uh, um, so it was called the Arkansas Agricultural, Mechanical and Normal College. Um, speaking of that college, uh, 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 a graduate of that college, actually, uh, um, along with Edith Irby Jones, were the two first African Americans in majority white graduate schools in the South. His name was Silas Hunt, and, uh, and he, he, he was admitted to the School of Law the same year that Edith was admitted to the, the School of Medicine. Uh, the other tragic event on Silas Hunt story is that he died of tuberculosis within uh, the first year of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of law school, so he never graduated. However, uh, uh, he is also, it's also important that we remember him in his, in his achievement as being the first African American in, in a, admitted uh, to the law school in Arkansas. So here's what happened in 1948 when our admissions committee, of which I'm part of right now, <laughs> When our admission committee in the, in the College of Medicine looked at 230 applicants, uh, uh, we rank those, we, they, they ranked the applicants at the time, 1948, and uh, number 28 out of 230, number 28 was Edith Irby Jones. That led to the dean to make a phone call, a famous phone call. Uh, he called the president of the University of Arkansas system uh, uh, by uh, President uh, Louis Jones. He called uh, Dr. Cheneau, who was uh, the dean of the College of Medicine, calls the president and said, President, we have a problem. What's the problem? The problem was that the person ranking 28 out of 230, and they, when they had 90 positions, they had 90, they admitted 90, 90 students at the time. Uh, the person scoring 28, her name is Edith Irby Jones. <clears throat> She's African American. President Jones, um, Lewis Jones, they had discussed this already in the, in, the, in the board for the university. And he said, well, we follow our process and we're gonna offer her admission. So that's the first person I want you to know. The first person is the uh, Charles Houston, who is uh, portrayed here. He is the, the, the chief attorney for the WMCP, uh, uh, um, who created the strategy of finding qualified African-American students, having them uh, uh, apply, having them be denied and go to the Supreme Court. He played a major role. This, uh, uh, the, we're gonna see the other characters in this story. Until then, this is, this is the admission rule of 1947. I want you to see this. <clears throat> Out of the students admitted, uh, uh, two were women and everything else is zeros. Zero, 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 zero African American. And actually one woman was admitted, uh, 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 everybody else white male. So this is our, our heritage until very recently. So what happens in Arkansas then, is that the Dean in the College of Medicine, this fellow right here in the lower left, um, his name is uh, Dr. Chenault, and uh, he, he is the Dean and he calls the president who is right here, Louis Jones, and say, we've got a problem. The problem is this African-American student is ranking 28 out of 230. The president says, you've got to admit her. The interesting thing is the president did not call the governor. And uh, it was a very shrewd move. Uh, he basically admitted her and said that this is academic independency. We're not going to consult with the governor. The governor at the time was a, a Governor Ben Laney, um, who was uh, elected into a, 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 a segregationist um, ideology and proponent of, uh, of segregation in schools. And he was vehemently against this, uh, 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 this, um, this admission. Uh, uh, when, he, when, he, when he was informed, eventually after the fact, he thought it was a disgrace that it would, uh, it, uh, a, 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 um, 
it would be it would diminish the the college when in fact uh, that admission the admission of E.D. Thurby Jones to the college elevated our college to be the first one in the south uh, 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 publicly supported predominantly white until then 100 percent white uh, college of medicine to admit an african-american student something that we're proud of today uh, but at the time was very controversial there were there were letters uh, from around the state some of them supporting the decision some of them uh, condemning the decision um, an interesting side a political note is that the the, the, the dean actually admitted one extra student that year why did he admit one extra student? He wanted to uh, take away the argument that one white applicant was not admitted because of this African-American student. So he admitted an extra student. And thus, the role of, of, uh, of uh, this is actually a copy of the freshman class role, a list of names, from 1948, and I don't know if you can see my, my mouse here, but right here, so all the, uh, uh, um, you see all these students, and there are some that are, some students have FE in them, which means female. However, only one student has a little N by her name, and that's Edith Irby Jones, a Negro student, admitted in 1948, becoming thus the first African-American admitted to a College of Medicine in the South, um, a major historical event. So let's go back to our history. It was history at the time. People realized that this is a big deal. And uh, Ebony Magazine uh, had this uh, uh, beautiful uh, uh, article with these photos. Look at these photos. Uh, Ebony Magazine uh, published this piece in the winter of 1949, saying Arkansas Med School opens its door. Brilliant hot spring girl is the first Negro to attend mixed classes since Reconstruction days. Uh, I love the pictures. This is Edith standing here uh, among all these students, the only one is African-American. Uh, there are these, these beautiful photos of her at home, the dean of the college. Look at this photo of her among the students. And the interesting thing is, if you look, by her are the two other uh, uh, female students. They became friends. She also mentioned a couple of stories that I want to share with you because these are deeply human stories that only by knowing them you can kind of understand the, that it's, it's important for us to remember that there are good people that are willing to fight and to stand for what's right. Two stories she tells. One, she tells a story of one of these, one of these two um, female students, became, they became very good friends. And, um, and one day they were taking a bus and they could not ride together because there was a section for African-Americans and a section for whites. Um, so the, the, the white student, actually her father gave her a car so they could ride together uh, since they could not ride together in the bus. The second story of these days uh, 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 in, uh, involves the veterans. The veterans, uh, the, 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 the veterans that had fought in World War II, um, they came back and they, and, and they Edith felt that she, that they made a shield around her to make sure that people would not mess with her, that, uh, that she felt protected by the veterans. The veterans had a very uh, uh, positive outlook um, on her and she felt welcomed and protected by them. The final story, uh, there's so, so many uh, uh, neat human stories uh, uh, in, this, um, in this historical moment. Uh, at times, she would still the medical school. Uh, so the dean, the dean of the medical school, said that there's going to be no segregation in the classroom, because if you see here, she is sitting with all of the students. Uh, uh, in Fayetteville, in the school of law, they created a barrier for Silas Hunt 
or he took for, so that he could be separated from the white students. Here in the College of Medicine, the dean said it's going to be no segregation. Uh, they're going to have to share, you know, anatomy, the labs, and the microscopes and everything. So I said no segregation in medical education. It was a brave decision, smart politically, uh, the right decision. Um, she, she also speaks about the fact that from time to time when she was eating by herself, because she was the only student to go to the segregated cafeteria area for African-Americans, uh, she would find uh, uh, flowers placed there by the, the staff of the cafeteria in the cleaning staff in the hospital because those people are majority african-americans which they still are today and they would leave flowers for her in her in her table so she could she could feel that she was not alone she was also helped financially by the hot springs uh, uh, um, community uh, as well as by the african-american community throughout the state she was supported so to give you a sense of uh, what happens then, first of all, the governor, Governor Laney, lose, loses his re-election campaign. And in 1949, he's gone, no longer governor. Uh, Dean Chenault uh, retires a few years later. He is responsible for helping move, getting the, the college to start moving from downtown to the location we still have today. He retires. <clears throat> President Lewis Jones um, retires eventually and becomes one of the leaders in the interfaith movement in the United States. He moves to Florida and then New Jersey, and he becomes one of the leaders of the interfaith movement in the country. And then Charles uh, Houston Hamilton, let me, let me make sure I got his name right. Uh, Charles, um, Houston, Charles Hamilton Houston, that's his name, Charles Hamilton Houston died uh, very young um, in the early 50s. He is succeeded by his, um, his assistant, his legal uh, uh, partner and assistant, uh, Turhold Marshall who, of course, you all know, eventually became the first African-American in the Supreme Court of the United States. But he made a difference. And his strategy paid off. His strategy opened this door by which we got Silas Hunt admitted to the School of Law, by which we had Edith Irby Jones admitted to the College of Medicine. So we saw her young. We saw her um, graduating high school right here on the left. Um, beautiful young woman. We saw this seriously looking doctor, uh, Dr. Jones now. She had married uh, during that time. Er Edith Irby becomes Edith Irby Jones by marrying Dr. Jones, who was a professor uh, in Pine Bluff. And, um, and then we see her years later, after she had broken more uh, barriers through her talent, through her hard work, she became, uh, she went to practice in Hot Springs after graduating, and then she went to Houston, Texas, to become the first um, African-American resident uh, at Baylor. And uh, she had a, uh, she did a residency in internal medicine. Uh, she had her own clinic in Hot Springs and then in Houston. And she lived her life decently, with dignity, uh, using her talent for good, taking care of people. Uh, she eventually became the first president of the National Medical Association, uh, first African-American female president of, uh, so she had, a, she had a good life. She had several children. When we celebrated uh, her in 18, she came with her children. Uh, when, we, um, when we celebrated her, when I gave this lecture last time to the Alumni Association, her daughter was here. Uh, I was able to see her again. Good people, decent people, hardworking, uh, talented. So why does it matter? Why have I been 
so moved by this story and why so many people have been touched and moved by this story. It's not only me, it's an example of so many people. Here's why, and I'm gonna share with you the present so we can look a little bit of where we are after all these years. We had our first Afghan, uh, female African-American Surgeon General in the person of Joycelyn Elders. Now a side note is that Dr. Elders decided to try medical school after seeing Edith Irby Jones talk at Philander Smith College uh, when she was an undergrad. Uh, um, so, and she, Dr. Elders, was also our first African-American faculty member. So I'm, I'm the associate dean for faculty. I'm very proud that our first African-American faculty member uh, uh, um, is still around um, and, uh, and became such a prominent person in our country. We have had our first chair, department chair, the chair of physiology from 1980 to 1994, uh, Dr. Rayford was the chair of uh, physiology, scientist. We had our first African-American dean in the person of Dean Al Rees, who is now the dean uh, of the School of Medicine at the University of Maryland in Baltimore. These people came through one door opened by this one person that we, you met today, born in Conway, raised in Hot Springs, Edith Derby Jones. These people, this great talent, first faculty member, first chair, first dean, came through that door that she, she left open in 1948. So in 1948, of course, we had one student, one African-American student in the class of 50. In 2018, we have 51. When I did this lecture two years ago, we had total 51 African-American students, um, which is about seven, which was at the time, is about 7% of our student body. So we can do better than that, for sure. The, the population of African-Americans in the state is around 15%. So my personal goal would be to at least double that. We had 24 residents, which is actually 3.7% of all residents. So we can do much better than this. If at all possible, I would quadruple this number uh, in terms of residents. And my, my people, the faculty members in the College of Medicine, when we counted here in 2018, we had 58, which is about 4% of our college faculty after being African-Americans. I would love to quadruple this as well. This would be a goal for us, a goal for our college. We have put in, in uh, uh, as part of our policies that we, we have uh, two underrepresented minorities that we are aiming to increase representation in the college, that being African-Americans and uh, Latinas, Hispanic. So I showed you a history that of our last 70 years, now 72 years, I reminded you that that was 69 years after the foundation of the college. So what I wanted to leave you with today is a couple of thoughts. The first is, What's going to be like 70 years from now in, uh, when, when we do this in 2088, 60, 68 years now? Many of, us, many of us will not be here in person. But our actions, they have ripple effects over time. And what we do today can have an impact for more than one generation. You saw what Edith Irby Jones did by working hard, being smart, dedicated, uh, um, applying to medical school, getting admitted. 70 years later, we, 72 years later, we're still talking about it. We still know the effect that that had. 
what we do today has effect for many, many years to come. So I ask you just to think about, not only about the past, I, I think it's important to remember the past every day, but to consider the future and to consider what we want and what type of school we want to be in the future, what the type of society we want to be. We have a lot of work ahead of us. And uh, I know that the people that I'm talking to are people that care about these matters, that want to see justice, that want to make sure that America fulfill its promise to all its citizens. So oh, let me see if I can go back to my slides. So 70 years from now, people are going to be living and building and studying and taking care of patients in the school that we built today in 2020, in the middle of a pandemic. And why does it matter today as the Dean of Faculty? I want to show you a slide that I'm very proud of that uh, took some work to do and, uh, and I love it because from this one person, from this one person of E.D. Therby Jones, we now got all this talent. All these, these are photographs of faculty members in the College of Medicine. In this group, I have two chairs, the chair of urology and the chair of uh, uh, PMNR. I have one director of our animal lab. I have one assistant dean that worked with me. I have my dear friend, Dr. Uh, Billy Thomas, who at the time was our chance, vice chancellor for diversity. All this talent that you see in your screen right now, these are signed, all of them. These are either MDs or PhDs. These are scientists, physicians, clinicians, surgeons that we have today that came through our university, through the door that was open in 1948. My role as the Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs is to remind people that diversity helps us, that diversity is a as our current chancellor is known to say, diversity is our superpower. It's by the, by the ability that we're able to select, recruit, retain, and develop a group like this of talented uh, uh, scientists and physicians that we're better, that we're a better medical school. So I am grateful to Dr. Edith Irby Jones for opening that door. I'm grateful to each one of these faculty members to, for bringing that talent, their skills, their hard work to UMS. And I'm hopeful, I am hopeful that we are better today than we were 70 years ago. And that by the work that we, you and I, can do together, we will be better, even better. Compared to today, we're going to be even better 70 years from now. I think that we, have, we still have work to do, of course. I have no illusions. Uh, but I see progress. I see, uh, um, I see hope. When I see this group of uh, smiling faces, I see hope. I see hope that we will be, we'll be able to get there uh, together. Not, not separate, but together. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Eric. That was, uh, that was really a very interesting presentation. And of course, Dr. Jones has made such a, she made such an impact on, on Arkansas and the nation. So I really appreciate uh, you giving, uh, you uh, 
giving us a summary of her life and career tonight. I really appreciate it. Let me see if we have any questions. If you have any questions, please feel free to write them in the, uh, the chat box. Um, and let's see. Thank you for the opportunity. I, I have a lot of, uh, I have to say, I have lots of friends in the audience. So, so uh, I, see, uh, I see some friends in the audience. So I'm happy about that. That's great. That's great. I, we're always pleased when we have a good participation. Yes. Uh, thank you guys for being here. I know these are, these are difficult days uh, for all of us. And, and we're all a bit exhausted. Uh, but you guys stick around. You guys, uh, you guys stick around. Okay. Let's see. There's some chat activity here. Oh, no, no, no. Chat. Let's see. Hi, Eric. Thank you, Dr. Macias. Very powerful. Great presentation. Why did Dr. Jones go to Knoxville College? Good question. <laughs> Good question. Uh, 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 I don't know why she went to Knoxville College. That's a good question. Uh, 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 Tim Nutt, Dr. Nutt here, has a, has a, a transcript of, a, of an, an, an interview that she gave to the Memory Project, Arkansas Memory Project. Maybe there we'll find a... Uh, an answer, but I don't have the answer on top of my head. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, Knoxville College is that a, a, a historically black university? Um, I, I, but I don't know why she went there instead of uh, UAPB or what was what mm -hmm. became UAPB. Um, but we'll be able to find that information, I'm sure, and I can send it out uh, to the group. I'll, I'll have your email address. Mary, Mary Ryan. Yeah, Mary Ryan. Mm -hmm. yes. Mary, I'll be able to let you know, and I can post this on the Facebook page, too, um, to let you know uh, if, if, there's an, if she uh, addresses it in her interview. Thank you, guys. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, everyone, we appreciate you being here and we'll hope you will be back on August 2nd uh, for the next stay at home lecture. Thank you all. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. Bye.